What's going on, Packer fans? Welcome back to another episode of the Pack a Day Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Pack a Day Podcast, but none of that stuff matters because I am joined once again by the one and only Ben Fennel. You can follow him on Twitter at Ben Fennel underscore NFL, my absolute favorite draft analyst, my favorite person to talk to this time of year. One of my favorite people to talk to at any point of the year. But Ben, welcome back to the show. How the heck are you doing? I'm doing great. We're sitting here a week away from the 2023 draft. An exciting time. We're all a little anxious to find out who our new players players and parts and toys are going to be on each uh, franchise in the NFL. And, um, you know, it's an exciting time period for people that study the draft. And I think we're all just uh, a little anxious to get the uh, round one started next Thursday, seven, eight days away out in Kansas City. And uh, this Packers team and their offseason and uh, their picks ahead are certainly fascinating and interesting to dive into. Yeah, it certainly is. We're going to get to all of those. We're going to get to some of your favorite guys in this draft. I want to get through all of that, but it has been a minute since we've had the opportunity to talk. It's been a crazy offseason in Green Bay. I just want to get your 30,000 foot view on what the Packers offseason has looked like and the likelihood that Aaron Rodgers is probably going to be a New York Jet at some point. Who the heck knows when? Uh, my collective view on the offseason is it's been a complete crapshoot. You know, I have no idea what the offseason plan is, was, will be moving forward. Um, I think it's just a fluid situation with their quarterback where the relationship and the long-term plan clearly crumbled uh, over the last six months, four months, three months, whatever the timeline is. Um, and just trying to project forward, I don't entirely know the plan based on the moves of the team, based on the spending, the free agent moves. I don't know if you're trying to surround a young quarterback with parts or, you know, veteran parts. You just hit reset and go through a youth movement and rebuild. This is a straight throwaway year. Um, has the Rodgers situation limited their spending because of not knowing how much money they have to play with? And, um, you know, this offseason, I think collectively, just take a step back. I have no idea, Andy, what the plan of this team is. It makes it fun to talk about. It makes it, uh, uh, you know, interesting, uh, fascinating for a lot of different reasons. There's a lot of motion uh, also wrapped up into this team. And uh, I think considering the last five years of this organization, one of the more fascinating franchises in the league and in professional sports. Um, and we could talk about it, you know, for hours and hours. It's a, it's a fun conversation if you could kind of take the emotion away from things. Um, and this offseason certainly uh, was no different. And I think leading up to the draft and after the draft and into 2023, it's going to continue. So get used to the chatter. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of interesting things that I'm sure come out of the Rodgers trade and how they, you know, basically go through the draft, what positions they target, those sort of things. It's just such, it's an interesting roster. They obviously haven't done much. I think this is an evaluation season for them. I think they want to evaluate, you know, all right, did some of the stuff Joe Barry did at the end of last year? And, you know, I don't know that that was that exciting, but can that carry over into this year? What does Jordan Love look like as a starting quarterback? What does Matt LaFleur's offense look like without Aaron Rodgers? Like, it feels like to me, they want and they want to look at Dobbs and they want to look at Wyatt and Quay and, and Christian Watson, all these young players. It just feels to me like this is going to be an ultimate evaluation season. And then after this year, they're going to make the determinations. All right. Is Matt system broken? Is Joe Barry broken? Is Jordan Love the long term starter? It just feels like everything sort of needs to get evaluated almost post Aaron to see who's really to blame. Was Aaron lifting everything up? Was Aaron, you know, holding some things back? I think that's going to be a huge piece to this. But it's also like this weird, and we've kind of talked about this in the past, it's almost like this weird no man's land where. You've got a lot of veterans on this team, a David Bakhtiari, a Preston Smith. You've got a 30-plus-year-old punter that's on a one-year deal for some reason. Like, you've just got, like, a lot of weird, bizarro veterans on this team that don't fit, like, the long-term timeline at all. Aaron Jones is another one of those. And then you've got, like, all your young guys that you need to evaluate. And in the meantime, it's like, all right, are we – are we trying to win a bunch of games? Are we trying to just like, I don't know. It's just a, it's a weird spot to be in. It is, you know, it's tough to evaluate. It's tough to figure out based on their decisions, which a lot of times you figure out the direction and the collective evaluation and their goals based on the decisions and the moves of the team, but they've been so inactive. It's tough to figure out what their self-assessment is. And it's certainly a big year for the sophomore evaluations, even the third year evaluations like guys like, Eric Stokes and, uh, you know, Josh Myers and some guys that have been fixtures as young players, major decisions too. You know, what do you do with Rashawn Gary, you know, who is ascending to be one of the premier edge rushers off an injury? Well, now he's entering his fifth year as a first round pick. Certainly the decision on Jordan Love's a big one, which I think they have to make May 1st or something yep. coming up as well. And some interesting money 
tied up in positions that a lot of the league isn't prioritizing right now. You have money tied up in running back, money tied up in nose tackle, money tied up in guard. Um, you have a inconsistent Jair Alexander last year. You have money tied up in Bakhtiari. I think over the next year, which last fall I started to allude to major change coming. Well, I'll pump the brakes on that. But I think over the next calendar year, this team is going to look completely different. And there's going to be some tough decisions to be made. And I think reflecting the tough decisions to be made, Andy, there might have been tough decisions that should have been made. And I think the evaluating whether Rodgers should have been traded last offseason with Devontae is a really fascinating one. I know we kind of want to move this forward to the draft and into 2023, but I think that's kind of all part of it. You know, there are major decisions and major changes to be made with this team. And this is not a team that changes very often. And I don't know how they respond to change. Um, and it doesn't appear to be well. <laughs> no, it's it's been difficult, and it's certainly there's but there's been some decisions where they've moved on a year too late rather than a year too early, which has been sort of their mo in the past. And yeah, it's, and I know you know obviously this is draft season. We're going to get to that more in just a moment. But but you and I are both people who look at everything holistically, look at everything 365 days, and look back what happened previously, and then sort of project what's going to happen moving forward. And like you said, usually with teams with really good teams that have like a sound foundation, you see a path, you see a specific vision that they have for their team. And it's just been really sort of difficult to suss out exactly what Green Bay's vision has been through this last couple of seasons. I think they were trying to go all in, but didn't quite get there the way that the Rams and the Buccaneers did. But they also borrowed a bunch from future salary caps, gave Aaron Rodgers this massive deal this past year, rather than trading them and getting the super haul from the Denver Broncos in return that the Seahawks got for Russell Wilson. Like there's just some, I think there's going to be, some points in the road that we look back to and be like, hey, you want to know why they're four and 13, you know, in 2020, whatever, like go back and look at these couple points in the road and say yeah. like, yeah, that kind of, you know, we could have maybe saw that coming a little bit. And the five-year window is just fascinating from the change at head coach to them then drafting and moving up and taking Jordan Love. They're obviously QB of the future to then the back-to-back -back MVPs and then giving Rodgers a very inflexible contract. There's just a lot of interesting moves that were a little bit self-destructive as far as the draft picks, as far as the contracts. Um, and now they're starting to kind of ebb and flow based on the tendencies that they've done and operated with the last 10 to 20 years. I mean, taking a first round linebacker last year, a 24 year old defensive tackle. You know, there's just some moves that are a little bit questionable and suspect. And something I've been harping on the last year or two is, I just don't know what the accountability structure is on an organization like this without a pure owner, without a pure man and, you know, iron fist at the top. I just feel like the major decision makers sit at the same round table and somebody has to fall on their own sword for decisions to be made or someone to get let go. So I think there's a lot of criticism and evaluation around Gutekunst and Joe Barry and everybody in between. This is not a team that likes to change very often. So it's a lot of... Uh, square pegs and round holes and we're just going to keep plowing forward but at some point i want to know what the accountability structure is and what the threshold is for change and you know i think we sit here wondering what 2023 is going to look like and what type of changes could be ahead yeah, it's a team that's very set in their ways. I've, I've mentioned this before, but it's kind of like the Spider-Man pointing meme where I think you go back to this last season and Brian Gudikins can say, well, it wasn't my fault. Did you see where this roster was before I took over? And Matt LaFleur can say, well, it's not me. Look, I, I came here and I won 13 games back to back to back seasons as soon as I got here. Aaron Rodgers can say, hey, wasn't me. I was the back-to-back -back MVP just the last two years. You think this is my fault? And Joe Barry can say, hey, it wasn't for my defense at the end of the year. We wouldn't have even had a shot at the playoffs at the end of the year. And you just kind of go, everyone's pointing in a different direction and saying it's not me. And I think to your point, that's where somebody at the top has to have that accountability and say, no, this, this was this person's fault and we need to move on and make changes and be more aggressive with how we make that change. But it's going to be very interesting. I don't. I think that goes without saying. That being said, I do want to transition somewhat to the draft. So, I want you to put your your Ben Fennel GM hat on for the moment. Well, as if you're looking at Green Bay and the way that they're structured right now, what would be sort of your overarching philosophy or theme as to how Green Bay should attack this draft? Well, in just a very collective, broad stroke, you know, obviously going off of our previous uh, comments of not really knowing the internal evaluation of their own team, their own roster, their own competitiveness for 2023. I think the main goal is just improve the roster, be stronger, be faster, be more explosive, be more consistent, find players that are more reliable, find players that can make plays and make exciting impacts on either side of the ball. And I think that's kind of a very 
cop out kind of billboard just for every draft, but you want to get better. You know, you have your 53 and let's see where we can improve it. And this team has a lot of areas to improve, but, you know, based on the decisions this off season and looking at the roster right now, there are major areas to improve. So I don't think it should be too challenging to get better players on this team uh, over the next few weeks. No, I totally agree. I just, you know, did a did an episode very much about the same thing where you can look at this team and say, hey, wide receiver, safety, tight end, those are positions that you have massive needs at, but you can go all around. This team just needs playmakers. Like you said, they need to get better, faster, stronger, and just like they need more talent on the roster. And I think that the nice thing about Brian Gudikins is he's not going to be limited. He's not going to be like, well, I can't take this player because it like they have needs everywhere. They could use a, a better pass rusher opposite Rashawn Gary. And Rashawn Gary is a free agent coming off an ACL. Like that's an interesting one as well, as you mentioned. Like we don't have anything outside of, you know, any like concrete corner outside of Jair Alexander. And even as you mentioned, he was up and down uh, a season ago. We talk about safety. We talk about defensive line. Kenny Clark could still use help. We don't know what Devontae Wyatt's going to be. Offensive line 2024 needs help. Wide receiver tight end, we mentioned. Hey, they even need a backup quarterback probably at this point and probably some Jordan Love insurance in case that doesn't work out. Like there's there's not much that they can't attack in this draft in some way, shape or form. And just getting better talent all around the roster is, should be the priority this, this draft. You know, and there's a lot of teams that go into the draft with the philosophy. We want to enter the draft ready to play a game and that is very much a reflection of your free agency moves and how are you improving the roster prior to the draft and what that means that moniker means is we're not going to have to reach for need because we addressed all those needs in the free agency period now we can you know stick to our board and go with that best player available and maybe not have to reach for somebody looking at the Packers roster I do not see a team ready to play a game next week at the end no. of April you know, and if they are, I think it's easily a bottom three receiver room, a bottom three tight end room. I know what people say it's only April. You know, it's a long way away from the season. Absolutely. Months away from the season. But this is putting a lot of stress on the draft in your free agent class, for draft free agent class, to fill these holes and to improve the roster immediately through youth, which is a dangerous game to play, especially when you're making a rebuild and adding in some young players um, into, you know, big-time roles like the quarterback in Jordan Love. And I think you look at a team like the Houston Texans, they're going to have a young player at quarterback, whether it's Davis Mills in year three or Bryce Young or C.J. Stroud or somebody in between. Look at the moves they've made. They added veterans all over the place. They added Robert Woods of the world. Why? Because you don't just want it to be a rookie sophomore, you know, crapshoot going into NFL Sundays. You still want to have reliable, consistent players you can trust and they have exciting young pieces, just a little bit worried about the collective depth of the roster, the quality of the roster heading into the draft. But um, will it be hard to improve the roster because of that? Probably not. Yeah, no, very well said. And I do think – I do think Green Bay is probably going to be active in the post free agency period, post draft, getting some veterans. They've done pretty well getting guys like Devondre Campbell. I want to say Rick Wagner was a little bit after that point, obviously getting a Razul Douglas in season. Um, they've been able to attack some of those spots and get a, a veteran free agent here. There, obviously, Sammy Watkins did not work out last year, uh, but I think they can find a couple guys that they need to plug in. You know, based on what they don't get in the draft, but. Um, yeah, th this this roster, as you mentioned, is not ready to go out and play a, a 17 game season in any way, shape, or form. Um, you, you you say top, bottom three tight end room. Like, I don't even know if they have a tight end. Like uh, right. you know, Josiah Deguara, H back ish, and then you know Tyler Davis is the next one. Like that's not a tight end room. Like you, you don't even have a room at that point. So there's there's definitely some things that are going to have to. Well, be those addressed. are feature positions. We've seen that U position be dominated by Tunyon, and he's had big you know, uh, games and seasons in the past game. We know the importance of the wide tight end and big dog Mercedes Lewis and erasing defensive ends in the run game. Valuable, valuable position in LaFleur's offense that doesn't rely on just 11 personnel and three receivers. Beefing up and taking advantage of matchups is the name of the game. And I just don't see those types of players on the roster at the moment, but that's what the draft's all for. And there's seven rounds and there's a lot of room to add some talent and some players. Yeah, Brian Gutekinds is going to have some work to do, to say the least. Uh, you study this draft as much as anyone. Just in general, what what would you say, as you look at this draft as a whole, are the strengths and weaknesses of this year's specific draft? Well, positionally, I think the good are corner, edges, tight ends. Um, it's a little top-heavy at tackle. Um, and the bad, safeties, linebackers, interior line. And there's some middling positions. You know, the receiver, there's some talent through the middle of the draft 
quarterback, obviously a little top heavy, maybe not towards the back end. Um, so there are some positions that are a little bit between there, but um, every draft takes on different personalities and there's good players all through this draft. You just got to find them. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, it's an interesting draft to me. As I first started going over, obviously, some of the top guys in the draft, I was really excited, like guys like Tyree Wilson, of course, Will Anderson, I mean, the, the, the obvious guys, right? But um, as I was looking at this, I'm like, man, you, you look at you know, even the, the quarterbacks, there's not necessarily a consensus one. There's four, all of them could be really good, but there's not necessarily a consensus one A guy. You've got two, you know, in my opinion, two extremely good running backs, a, a position that's not super valued anymore. Um, wide receiver, I don't think you have that true one A guy like your AJ Green or a Julio Jones or a Calvin Johnson or someone like that. Tight end position is interesting. You've got, like you said, top heavy at offensive tackle, Skaronsky, wherever you want to play him. Edge rusher's got a couple top end guys, but like, and then maybe like a Christian Gonzalez. But um, even as I look at like the top of this draft, if I look at like previous drafts, and it, we never know how it's going to turn out, but like if you're looking at like top, top tier players, I even feel like this is a little bit of a watered down draft for that. It's, it's a really interesting draft overall. Yeah, it's not particularly a great draft, you know, and that's all comparative analysis. You need other drafts to determine if this is a good draft or bad draft. And collectively, it's not as good as it was in previous years. Next year's look a little sexier. You know, maybe the past few years had some higher end talent, but it doesn't mean there aren't high level players, immediate starters, backups, role players, depth. There are the tiers and players in every category, just maybe not the collective depth and volume that certain drafts take on. And that's the ebb and flow of the draft. And it's all cyclical. You know, just when you have a good year at corner, it's probably a bad year coming right behind it. And same with the quarterbacks and every other position. And it's a lot of fun. And I think if you kind of take the emotion out of the draft and really kind of take away the, you know, my team needs this. I got to have this. I like this guy and I hate this guy. If you just kind of take a level-headed approach to everything, every player has pros and cons, you know, and just kind of having a fair analysis, you can talk yourself into being excited about anybody. And we all get those rose colored glasses after a player's picked and it'd be like, oh yeah, you know, now that I see him in, as a potential Green Bay Packer, like, yeah, I could see why the, the team select them. The more I watch prospects in the NFL draft, the more I come to the conclusion of the exact same thing you said. You can find four or five things that you like about almost every single prospect in this draft. And you can find a few things where you're like, well, that could be something that potentially derails their career if they don't get it corrected and it doesn't go in the right direction. And um, there are strengths and weaknesses with every player. It's why every single draft guide and every single draft expert has strengths and weaknesses for every player. And just, again, trying to figure out which of those are going to be debilitating and which ones players are going to be but able to overcome. Fans, fans want to know. Fans just want to give me, give me, give me, give me the results. Where, where are they going to go? What's going to happen? We're not draft predictors. And I think the best analysts out there just give you a fair assessment on the players. I'm yeah, gonna... maybe they let you know who the higher end guys are. Hey, that's more of a first round talent. But if a guy goes seven or if he goes 40, I promise you, the best analysts don't care. They just want to paint a fair picture for the fans to get educated, whether that's pros, cons, style, fit, comps, things like that. Those are the best analysts, the ones that get emotional about landing spots and, hey, he's a second round pick, not a first round pick. That's really not the name of the game to be a draft analyst. And if 31 teams have a seventh round grade on a guy, Andy, and one team takes him in the second round, it's our job to explain why that spectrum exists. Yep. So it's not about being right and wrong because it just takes one out of 32 to make you right or wrong. That doesn't necessarily answer the question obviously we have to go through his career and figure out who he's going to be in the nfl so as a draft analyst and the best ones just explain the spectrum and give a fair assessment yeah the best ones are the artists that are painting a picture of the player the profile the good the bad the ugly um you know statistics analytics the the play on the field all of it the more that you can paint that picture of what they can do the, the more entertaining that is i think to, to certainly us as we listen to uh some of the best people breaking down some of the draft prospects that said the, the big sexiness of the draft is, of course, the first round and everyone gets excited and, uh, all, you know, hyper about which player was selected in the first round. Green Bay has picked 15 overall as of now, though, could easily see Brian Gutekunst wanting to move around the draft board a little bit. But as things stand right now, Green Bay selecting at pick 15, who are a few names that you would love to see Green Bay target at that spot? You know, and I'll tell you a name, the target, and then if they don't get them, I'll throw in a name to circle back a few rounds later and get someone like that. Beautiful. But at 15, I have a couple guys in here. First first of all, don't forget about offensive tackle. 
I don't have a name in here, but sitting at 15, if there's the Broderick Jones of the world or, you know, if a Paris Johnson falls, don't overlook the idea of tackle. Keep planning for the future. Keep protecting your quarterback. Keep him upright. Bakhtiari, by all intents, is only going to be here for a year, maybe a year. So yep. keep looking to the future. High-end tackles are hard to get. You're hoping to not be picking in the middle of the first round again. So if you're there, grab the high-end talent. So that's just my speech on tackle and the trenches collectively. But actual players, I love Jackson Smith and Jigba out of Ohio State, a pure route-running specialist that's going to catch everything. Yeah, he's got a little yak juice, but that's really not the name of the game. He's going to catch everything and separate. Those are my two favorite traits of receivers. Separate, catch the ball. I don't need you to run 4-3. I don't need you to make contested catches. Those are not primary skill sets. So to pair him with a young quarterback, to work over the middle of the field in the slot, which is clearly a need on this Green Bay team, checking a lot of boxes. If they don't go Smith and Jigba, get a Parker Washington on day three out of Penn State. Good size, another separator, a little more yak juice, actually. And a real threat, a real weapon, we all know about Zay Flowers. Three-level receiver, a guy you just want to put the ball in his hands and go say, make people miss, you know, turn a handoff into a 60-yard touchdown, get him on screens, a guy that can separate in the route, can win down the field as well. Those exciting playmakers, I think this Packers team really, really needs. If you can't get a Zay Flowers, grab a Demario Davis out of Liberty on day three. He's a spitting clone of him. I swear, he's the same guy. He's 5'8", 4'3", 170 pounds, soaking wet, does all the same things. And Andy, I love Michael Mayer. At another Dame. I think he could fill that wide tight end role. It reminds me a lot of Heath Miller coming out of Virginia to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Listen, he only caught 40, 50 passes a year. Made some tough grabs on third down. Good red zone threat. But when you're the Pittsburgh Steelers and you had Antonio Brown and Santonio Holmes and uh, Mike Wallace and all those, Emmanuel Sanders and Le'Veon Bell, suddenly the Heath Millers of the world take a back seat to those weapons, as right. a wide tight end should. Michael Mayer is a really good dual player, two-way player, good run blocker, good pass catcher, but he's not exceptional in anything, and that's okay. If you get a B-plus wide tight end in both phases, that's a pro bowler right there. So Michael Mayer, really high-level player. We'll see if he's worth the 15th overall pick. If you don't get him, let's see if he can circle back in the third round and get Sam Laporta out of Iowa, who I think does a lot of the same things, does a lot of the same things in a similar package, does a lot of the same things with the same athleticism, the same experience. So a Sam Laporta actually might be a better value. We could talk about the whole tight ends going in round one and whether it's actually worth that pick or not. But Smith and Jigba, Zay Flowers, Michael Mayer, those are the three I'm kind of circling, Andy. It's so funny. I'm just laughing at some of the things you're saying and some of the, the, the same thing. Jackson Smith and Jigba, for example, we get so caught up in every little minute detail of how these players get open and what they can do at the catch point and what the, Jackson Smith and Jigba gets open. Like it doesn't have to be super complicated. He gets open consistently. You talked about the separation like that. How much value is there in that? And like you said, some of the best wide receivers in the NFL, it, it like how fast did uh, Devonta Adams run? And I think even Stefan Diggs ran like a slower 40 than what Correct. you would expect yep. him to run. Like they just know how to get open. Like I, it does nothing else almost matters at that point. And that is like the beauty of his game. He, he separates and he catches the ball and we can go over every little intricate detail of how he runs. It doesn't matter because that's what he does well. And that's the simplicity of it sometimes. And then the, the Michael Mayer conversation, it's funny because I've been, you know, kind of grinding this all off season of, I don't necessarily think that there's been particularly great value at tight end in the first round. At the same time, like I really like all these tight ends. Michael Mayer is a fantastic example of that. You're getting somebody who can be a legitimate matchup piece at a wide tight end. Like, how hard are good wide tight ends to find in general right now? Much less you have the ability to be a blocker and a pass catcher. Like, those, it's just, it's so hard to find that player. We yeah. know how much Matt LaFleur would love that player, too. And Andy, I love throwing the litmus test out of guys like Heath Miller, who is the 30th overall, <clears throat> excuse me, the 30th overall pick about uh, 15 years ago at this point. Yep. Played a thousand snaps for 10 years. Now, was he this pass game weapon? Was he Gronk? No, but it's a great litmus test to NFL fans, scouts, evaluators on whether that's a quality pick. Because if you take a tight end, a wide tight end, that gives you 10 years of play, a thousand snaps a season with around 40, 50 catches a year, you take that every day of the week. So I think a Michael Mayer in there, yeah, you can project forward and say, well, if he ends up being our wide tight end for the next eight years, is the 15th overall pick worth it? Yes, it is. Now, is he going to produce like a, a, you know, a 
a Gronk, you know, type of tight end or uh, Antonio Gates or Tony Gonzalez or Travis Kelsey? No. And that's okay. You could still be a really quality first round player like a Heath Miller and be valuable to your team despite not being the top tight end in your fantasy team. You know, they do so much more for your team and your offense. I think that's well said. I think that's totally fair. Um, yeah, I just think, and especially in a draft like this where we talked about it's it's maybe not the the you know greatest draft in the world. <laughs> Go out and get good players at the end yeah. of the day. And I think if you and like as much as I am kind of anti tight end round one <laughs> in this draft, particularly you get a guy like that that could potentially help your team for a decade and play exactly what Matt Lafleur wants at that position. I understand it a bit more specifically in, in this no kind question. Of and Andy, I'm going to snipe your rundown here for a second, because the next question you have okay. is tight end position. Is it worth a pick at 15? The answer I have is yes, if they end up being a good player. <laughs> and I think it's just that funny moniker of like, uh, well, if you take a running back at 10, is it worth it? Well, if it ends up being a Hall of Famer, yeah, it's worth it. You know, so if they end up being good players, wherever you take them, it's probably worth it. Yeah, that's I mean, and, and I've said, like, if you can find that, obviously, even like, you mentioned like Heath Miller. Obviously, you can find the next Travis Kelsey or something like that. Like that's worth like pick one yeah. probably. But like, Travis Kelsey's don't exist every year, so it's no. a great litmus test. I'm like, oh, what do you think of Heath Miller? Is Heath Miller a good first round pick? What do you think of an Owen Daniels type of guy? You know, Todd what do you Heath. think of a yeah Todd Heaps and Mercedes Lewis of the world? Do they have good careers? And it's just a great conversation. There are only so many Travis Kelseys out there. There's only so many Shannon Sharps out there. Yeah. You know, so I think you need to kind of weigh the expectations as well to say. There are some really, really good players out there that, yeah, they're not going to be Hall of Famers, but it doesn't mean they're not, you know, year in, year out pro bowlers and great players uh, on Sundays. That's a fair point. A- after Michael Mayer, assuming he's your top tight end in this draft, how do you rank the next few? I know you like Laporta in like the third. How yeah. do you, you know, the the Kincaids, the, the Musgraves and uh, Darnell Washington? Yep, I have Kincaid just after Mayer for his ability to separate, catch the ball, you know, be a pass, a pass game weapon, but he's going to be more of a U tight end. Definitely like a Travis Kelsey or a Noah Fant, that kind of flex option. Then yeah. that Luke Musgrave, who isn't that much different from Kincaid, maybe not as special with his movements, but definitely longer uh, and more of a matchup nightmare with that length. Definitely like a uh, Gasicki down in Miami. Then the Darnell Washingtons. Then I have Laporta as my tight end five. But the next wave, some really good players. You know, that's Peyton Durham out of Purdue, who's a converted lacrosse player. He played one year of high school football. He's getting better and better. You know, Tucker Craft out of South Dakota State looks a lot like a Dallas Goddard type of player. Also the Jack Rabbit, you know, Luke Schoonmaker out of Michigan. He's a guy they barely threw the ball to. This guy's going to be a really good NFL player. Another one that's probably not going to be featured in the pass game, but it's going to do the dirty work for you. Davis Allen at Clemson and Zach Koontz at Old Dominion, the Penn State transfer, really good players. You know, Braden Willis and Brenton Strange, more of the H-back types, more of that move tight end, could probably serve some fullback. There's some really good players too. Um, so this tight end group, there's all sorts of shapes, sizes, abilities, whatever you need. There's some guys that are really tough. There's some exciting pass game weapons. There's some B minus in both phases, some special teamers. This tight end group's really good. So I think every team in the NFL should try to bolster their tight end room, add some competition, um, because these tight ends, don't, they don't come around every class. And I think the past few really kind of show you that Hey, if you need a true 260 pound wide tight end, you better go get them when they're available. Yeah, very much so. And if ever there was a year where Green Bay went into a uh, draft with only a Josiah DeGuara and a Tyler Davis, this might be the draft to go into it with, uh, especially again, as it's maybe not a super strong draft at other positions, tight end's a, a good one to kind of go out and get some guys in this. It's a good one next year too, but a lot more of the, the flex movement guys. You got the Georgia kid, you got Brant yeah, Cuthie yeah. out of Utah, some more undersized kind of pass game guys. Amazing. Love that you've already got these guys studied for 2024. Uh, all right. Let, let me just hear, you can go in any direction that you want. Some Ben Fennel pound the guy table uh, guys in this year's draft. Yeah. Coincidentally, a lot of big 10 guys, which I know our listeners, we got a lot of Wisconsin, Minnesota fans, a lot of Iowa fans. So, you know, I love my Jaden Reed out of Michigan state. I think this kid's an absolute dog, a three level receiver out there. I think he could do everything. Keanu Benton, I think is going to be an exceptional pro. Loved him since his freshman days at Wisconsin, whooping Ohio State in that Big Ten championship game. Yeah, I know they didn't get the win, but he beat up Josh Myers and Wyatt Davis pretty good. He's going to be a really good player. Tons of energy, good senior bowl week, really good kid, infectious personality. He's a guy I think is going to go day two all day long. Jack Campbell, 
man, I heard the Buffalo Bills love this kid. He'd be a great middle linebacker for a cover two, two deep team. Love Jack Campbell. People thought, yeah, he's a good player. But once he goes to Indy, that's where kind of his stock's going to die. No, he's an exceptional athlete at every bit of 6'4", 250. Looks like Leighton Van Der Esch out there. So we already talked about Sam Laporta. There's some guys in the SEC that have played inside, outside on the defensive line. Maybe aren't exceptional athletes. You know, maybe don't have the four six forties and the jumping through the building. These guys are going to play on NFL teams. You know, the Colby Woodens at Auburn, Isaiah McGuire at Missouri. You know, if you miss out on the Tyree Wilsons and those hulking defensive ends in the top 10, there's some guys that are kind of, you know, poor man's version of them on day two and early day three. So Isaiah McGuire, he's every bit of 275 for Missouri. Looks like a Preston Smith kind of guy, that hulking stand up defensive end coming off the edge. A lot of good power. And Vandy, this is one of the weirdest years for Alabama defensive backs. I feel like a premier position from a premier program. We're talking about them year in and year out. The love for Brian Branch has somehow died because he ran 4-6. I love him. I think Eli Ricks is a really interesting corner on day three. And don't sleep on Jordan Battle. This guy's played 3,000 snaps for Nick Saban on defense. Oh, yeah, another 800 on special teams. That doesn't usually happen. Because no. high-level players that go to Alabama usually leave redshirt sophomore years, junior, you play and start for two years. Jordan Battle's a captain, a leader. He's a fixture of that program. Again, a guy without exceptional traits. But he's just a really good football player. I could see him being the Tony Jefferson type where you go undrafted and then you play for 12 years. You know, one of those guys. So I always have tr- uh, crushes in the draft, and they take on different tones and styles and feels every year. Um, but – Jaden Reed, Benton, Campbell, Laporta, those Big Ten guys always have a little bit of crush for the Big Ten players. Yeah, Jack Campbell, absolutely one of my 1A guys in this year's draft. I actually had the opportunity to talk to Mike Wall. Spoiler, that episode will hit on uh, Friday. This one will air on Thursday. Um, So that'll be coming tomorrow. But him and I went off on Jack Campbell and how fun of a player he is and just just everything. I, I to me, he's a first round guy. And I know he, he might not go first round, but I, I don't know what's missing. Like he has. He has everything. Like it's, it's, he's a really fun player to watch. Yeah, I like him a ton. I think he's going to be a great plug-and-play linebacker. Uh, I expect him to have an impact just like Van Der Esch did as a rookie. Let's see if he can obviously weather the storm of the injuries that Van Der Esch did. But it's a team that can use a Mike linebacker and a leader like a Buffalo sitting there in the second round, I think that'd be a great fit. All right, now is the opportunity for you to nerd out entirely. Maybe some sixth, seventh round guys that uh, you're super excited about that maybe other people haven't heard about or you know had the opportunity to you know pop the highlight tape on for. Well, we already mentioned Demario Douglas at a Liberty. I might have said Demario Davis. That's the linebacker with the Saints. But Demario Douglas at a Liberty is my day three clone of Zay Flowers. Just wanted to hammer that in. A lot of our listeners, probably North Dakota State fans as well. Yep. Hunter Lepke. That tight end, fullback, H-back, do everything type of presence for that offense. I hate to stamp the Kyle Juszczyk, you know, comp to him, but he looks like a clone of him. He's a guy that's lined up all over the formation, blocks his butt off, actually has some really good athleticism, can run the ball certainly between the tackles. I think he had a back shoulder grab for a touchdown this year, like 20 yards down the field, down the sideline. He's going to, you know, he's going to play special teams for you. He's a... He's a, like a, a dirty work guy I really want on my team, whoever team yeah. that is. He's a guy you just want in your locker room. He's going to be a really fun player. Marte Mapu somehow didn't get a combine invite after having a huge senior bowl week. Got the call up from Sacramento State. He is speedy. He's tough. Some teams view him as a linebacker, which great week of practice at the senior bowl converting to linebacker. I want to keep him at safety. He's about 215 pounds, moves well, hits anything that moves, heavy on contact. I think he's going to be a really good player at the next level. And Julian Hill at a Campbell. That's right, Campbell University, Julian Hill. He's a day three tight end with a lot of athleticism and size. So he reminds me a little bit of uh, Adam Shaheen coming out of Ashland a few years back, who I think ended up being a second-round pick. I think if he goes on day three, the expectations will be a little bit more tempered than Shaheen, which I think people thought he was going to be this freak show at the next level. Julian Hill, Campbell. Don't forget about him if he squeezes into the sixth or seventh round. And Mapu, a guy that the Packers brought in for a pre-draft visit as well. So oh, very um, nice. yep. and last year, Green Bay ended up with seven guys on the roster of the 29 or 30 guys that they brought in for pre-draft visits, including drafting six of them. So uh, when they bring a guy in for a visit lately under Goot, it definitely seems to indicate that they have some interest in the players. So that is definitely one to keep an eye on. 
Um, I'll ask you one more question and I'll let you get out of here. Ben, Green Bay will be successful in this draft if blank. I think they just need to get better players on the roster and don't overthink this process. Um, I've had some passionate disagreements with some of their picks throughout the middle of the draft. I hope to get on board uh, with their draft board and their projections and um, maybe streamline those picks just a little bit to the consensus, uh, particularly in that day two region. But I think Green Bay just needs to make some hard decisions. And if they need to trade Rodgers for 75 cents on the dollar at this point, I think they need to move ahead for everybody's sake. Um, the players in the locker room, the future of that locker room, the front office, the GM. I think the relationships have been strained. I think this process has been taxing. Um, and I think for everybody involved, I think just making some hard decisions for yourself and moving forward to the future is probably best for all parties. So uh, that draft day could be some blockbusters. It could be the day Rodgers goes. It could be the day a Bakhtiari gets traded. It could be the day a Rashawn Gary gets traded. You know, I'm really kind of open to anything and everything. So if they want to hit a major reset and say, you know what, for Rashawn Gary, for example, we're going to have to pay him. What if we get two first-round picks for Rashawn Gary? These are the types of conversations going on. So I know there's fans that are emotional and saying, oh, we can't trade Rashawn. Are you kidding me? Everything is on the table with a team like this. And I think when you have players that like a Jair Alexander, one of the top played corners, paid corners and had an up and down year, everything and everyone is up for discussion. So I think they need to make some tough decisions and take a giant leap towards the future. I almost, almost did a full episode on why Green Bay should trade Jair Alexander this offseason. And I couldn't quite bring myself to do it, mostly because... Green Bay just seems allergic to hitting the reset button and kind of going in that direction and going with picks. Like it's just, it, until they prove to me that they are actually willing to go in that major rip the bandaid direction, which I think they had the opportunity to do last year. I think they had the, another opportunity to go in that direction this year and didn't. Until I see that, I'm mm -hmm. going to be hesitant on, you know, sort of thinking that they will, but I'm with you. They, they should be having those conversations. I just don't necessarily think, unfortunately, that we'll see what happens. But I don't think they're yeah. necessarily having those, just because that hasn't been how they operated. But yeah, a lot of a lot of contract restructurings as well, too, which has made this complicated. Because before so. the restructuring, there were some candidates to be cut. You know, an Aaron Jones of the world. You know, if you were going to have a young rebuilding team, was he worth that capital? But then there's the philosophy of, well, if we're not paying our quarterback a lot, let's add some expensive weapons around him. So a lot of ways to kind of assess a team like this moving forward um, is philosophical decisions that everybody in that Packers front office has an opinion on what they should do. Um, and it's really exciting to kind of track this over the next week in particular, but six months and they're on out into the 2023 season. Yeah, really quick. It's, it, I think what happened too is they did all of these restructures to try to keep the team together the past couple seasons. And what basically ended up happening is if you did go on and release some of these players or trade some of these players for like late picks, like we just saw the Allen Robinson trade with the Rams, um, like if they did some of that stuff, they end up either paying more money or they end up like not having any savings where it's just like they, they basically painted themselves into the corner where it's like, I guess we'll just keep Aaron Jones for another year. And I just, I guess we'll keep Preston Smith for another year. And instead of, again, we circling back to the beginning of the show, instead of kind of making those very difficult decisions, you know, a year or two earlier when they probably needed to make them, they painted themselves into a corner where almost they couldn't cut them or couldn't trade them because it just ended up being almost disadvantageous to do that. So yeah. they're just, they're in this bizarro no man's land and I'm, I'm hopeful and excited to see if they can kind of paint their way out of it and build themselves a, a bridge to the future moving forward. And, and this it, week's a large and way. Andy, to... like my philosophy, just to kind of take some emotion out of it, everybody has a price. Yeah. So I know we're mentioning some big names here and the Rashawn Garys and Aaron Jones of the world and even guys like Kenny Clark. Love Kenny Clark. Love him on the field, off the field. Love him personally. I'm, you know, pleasure to call him a friend of mine. You know, so there's some guys that you have to take the emotion out of and every player has a price. So when you're rebuilding and you have some high dollar contracts, there's going to be some tough decisions to be made. I think you have to take some emotion out of it and understand, hey, this is a business. Hey, this is a team. We're trying to get better. We're trying to plan for the future, We're trying to make, you know, constructive decisions. Um, and this team has made some interesting decisions that's going to have some band-aids to rip off. So take some emotion out of it. Every player has a price and we have to make some moves uh you know, that are aggressive moving forward. And it's kind of an exciting time period as well.
I agree completely. Could be a very fun draft weekend to say the least. Ben, you are the absolute best. We will catch back up after the draft to break down the players that the Packers actually did select. Hopefully we have some fun presents to unwrap. Uh, I will talk to you then. Uh, until then, where can we follow you on Twitter and where can we find your work? You can follow me at Ben Fennel underscore NFL. As always, uh, I'll be heading out to Kansas City uh, in a few days for the draft week. I'll be working with NFL Network and Daniel Jeremiah um, and Joel Klatt, Charles Davis, all of our analysts out there uh, helping them on the set. I've already done a lot of the videos and the prep work for our broadcast. And, and I'll be working on my tour card all summer. I think the short game is really going to click through the summer months in the heat. And then before you know it, Training camp will be here. I'll be back in the Eagles media department, CBS on Sundays. Might be kicking around a Thursday night football idea this year, so could be adding some ventures as well. But in the near future, follow NFL Network and our draft coverage next week. Can't wait for next week, Ben. Enjoy the process. We will talk soon. That does it for us today. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.